impact of non-sustained BT. All right. Um, now, I've spoken to a lot of people who have ectopics and who have palpitations, and um, one of the things that's very obvious is that uh, the palpitations cause them a great deal of anxiety. And um, when I'm talking to them, I want to know what that anxiety, what causes that anxiety. And uh, there are three main responses. The first is that people say, oh, I'm worried that this may mean I'm having a heart attack. And I say to them, it's highly unlikely because heart attacks don't present generally with palpitations, particularly in young people. Um, heart, does, heart attacks tend not to occur in young people. They tend to occur in much older people. And when they occur, they present with chest pain, not palpitations. Secondly, um, people say, I'm worried that um, uh, I might go into AFib. And again, I say to them, "There's a. it's highly unlikely. And even if you did go into AFib, Yes, it's a bit inconvenient, but in the short term, in the immediate term, it's not dangerous to be in AFib. Uh, in the long term, there's a risk, but not in the short term. So even if you did go into AFib, don't worry about it. It's not going to be the end of the world by any means, all right? And then the third thing that people can uh, worry about is whether they could go into something called non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, NSVT, or ventricular tachycardia. And... Uh, I haven't done a video on non-sustained VT, and I thought um, I would uh, quickly do a video on this subject uh, because it seems to be very poorly covered on the internet, and there's a great deal of misunderstanding about it and, and creates a lot of anxiety, and I thought I'd try and clarify things. So, the first thing to say is, what is ventricular tachycardia? Okay, ventricular tachycardia is a, is a heart rhythm disturbance in which the uh, electrical impulses that make the heart contract are generated from the bottom of the heart, i.e. from the ventricles. Normally, impulses are generated from the top of the heart in uh, a part of the heart known as the pacemaker or the sinoatrial node. All right. Now, when impulses are being generated in the bottom of the heart, they don't cause as strong a heartbeat as when impulses are generated in the pacemaker. So the heart does not pump out as much blood as it should. This coupled with the fact that in ventricular tachycardia, the heart rate often races quite fast means that the demands go up because the heart is racing and therefore having to pump a lot more. And therefore it in itself being a muscle needs more blood because it's working harder. But actually it's not pumping out as much blood because A, the uh, the impulse is being generated in the ventricle by itself means that it's going to not pump out as much blood. Secondly, when it's going that fast, uh, it doesn't get time to fill with blood and therefore can't pump it out. And so there, there are two main problems that happen with ventricular tachycardia. One, the demand goes up. Two, the supply of blood goes down. Okay, And that in combination, if left over a prolonged period of time, means that the heart then becomes devoid of blood itself, it starts suffocating, and therefore it can stop functioning. And then that condition is called ventricular fibrillation. And ventricular fibrillation is the same as cardiac arrest, and it's a lethal rhythm. So, um, <clears throat> so this is why ventricular tachycardia is considered a dangerous rhythm, because it can lead to ventricular fibrillation. However, the danger associated with ventricular tachycardia applies to people who have sustained ventricular tachycardia, which means that the ventricular tachycardia has to go on for more than 30 seconds. Okay. Um, uh, however, there is another condition called non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, which by definition is not sustained. And therefore, in non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, what happens is that the impulses, <clears throat> uh, you can still get uh, ventricular impulses, uh, but they don't go on for more than 30 seconds. The second thing is that the definition is a little bit, uh, is quite wide. So you can have three ventricular ectopics in a row going at 120 beats per minute, and that is enough to call that rhythm non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. Having said that, someone could have 40 ventricular ectopics in a row, and if they're less than 30 seconds long in duration, if they're less than 30 seconds in all, they would still be called non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. And so, although there are some forms of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia which do worry me, I don't think 
uh, people who are getting three or four ectopics in a row, but are therefore defined as having non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, are as worrying by any means. So the definition covers such a wide spectrum, uh, and uh, unfortunately, because the same definition is applied to this, a person who may just be getting three ectopics in a row, as someone who's getting 40 in a row, uh, the, the consequences are very different. Okay, uh, and what happens is we don't, it's not uncommon for us to see on halter monitoring, you know, people getting three ectopics in a row, and we have to define that as non-sustained ventricular tachycardia because they're having three ectopics in a row and the heart is going a bit fast, so you, you know, the report reads out runs of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, and as soon as people see that, they obviously think that we're describing ventricular tachycardia, i.e. sustained ventricular tachycardia, and this causes people a great deal of anxiety because they're worried that, oh, will my heart go into ventricular fibrillation? And this is not true. Um, so let me just talk you through uh, a few things, okay? The first thing to say is it is almost impossible to know just from how they feel whether ectopics are atrial or ventricular. And it is, all, it is definitely impossible for someone just to feel some palpitations, say, I'm sure I'm getting non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. You can't. Non-sustained ventricular tachycardia is an ECG diagnosis. It's not a clinical diagnosis. You're getting palpitation. Um, and if someone did an ECG and found three or more ventricular ectopics in a row going at 120, then they would say, oh, that palpitation or that episode was due to non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. The second thing to say is it may be completely asymptomatic. And if it's asymptomatic, what does it matter? Because um, you would never need any tests anyway. And that's okay. There are people who have, who have non-sustained ventricular tachycardia and it's asymptomatic and they're doing fine. Um, and we don't go around looking for non-sustained ventricular tachycardia in people who don't complain of anything. Um, the second thing is non-sustained ventricular tachycardia by definition is not sustained and therefore does not carry the same connotation as sustained ventricular tachycardia. Sustained ventricular tachycardia, so non-sustained ventricular tachycardia could feel like this. Okay, but anything could feel like that. Three supraventricular ectopics could feel like that. Any rhythm could feel like that. Sustained ventricular tachycardia will feel like this. And if you come out of it, it'll go like a light switch. Very different, okay? Um, <clears throat> The third thing to say is up to 3% of normal people, normal, completely healthy people, will have some non-sustained ventricular tachycardia if you monitor them. Non-sustained ventricular tachycardia is seen in normal hearts, but is seen more frequently in people who have diseased hearts. And therefore, if someone is found to have non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, the doctor becomes duty-bound to try and work out whether they have a normal heart, in which case it's benign, or whether it's a marker of a diseased heart. If the heart is diseased, it's a sign that the heart is irritable, and in that setting, it becomes more important, and therefore, uh, it should cause, uh, it should lead to more investigations and trying to treat the underlying problem, ideally. If, on the other hand, the heart is completely normal, then, then nothing else needs to be done. So, Here's the kind of things I do if I see someone who has non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. The first thing I want to work out is, do they carry any risk factors? Okay, and in terms of risk factors, I would say there are four main risk factors, four red flag signs when I see non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. I would always ask the patient if there is a family history of sudden unexpected death in a young person under the age of 40. Number two, I would ask the patient, whether they've ever suffered a blackout, especially on exercise. Number three, I would ask them if they were ever born, or if they were born with congenital heart disease, or fourthly, if they had acquired any heart disease, i.e., you know, a person at the age of 50 had a big heart attack and is now getting palpitations, and I see non sustained ventricular tachycardia. That would make me a little bit more worried than someone who's 25 
who's never had a problem, who has no family history, uh, and in, uh, who's complaining of a few palpitations, and I find a bit of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia on the ECG. The second thing I would always do is do an echocardiogram to make sure that the heart is strong. Why is that important? A, because <clears throat> um, sometimes non-sustained ventricular tachycardia can be a sign of a, of a weak, undiagnosed heart, and you want to obviously make that diagnosis and try and get the patient on medications to strengthen the heart up. And two, because if you have a strong heart, then you know that even if the heart is not pumping as much blood during the ventricular activity, it's probably going to still pump out enough to keep things going. If the heart is already weak and then you go into ventric non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, then you're pumping out even less from a compromised system anyway. And that makes it far more worrying. All right. And that's why it's important. But if you have a normal ejection fraction, if the heart is structurally normal, then that's incredibly reassuring. And then the third thing I'd like to know is, okay, the heart is strong, the patient doesn't have any red flag signs, but is that heart getting all the blood it needs at times of stress? And that I would particularly think of in older people who are more likely to have heart artery narrowing. And in an ideal world, what I would do is put the patient on the treadmill, make them exercise, and see firstly whether the heart is getting all the blood it needs, and secondly, whether the, the whether I can provoke any heart rhythm disturbances, all right? Provided these tests are okay, and I was only seeing very short-lived runs of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, say three beats, four beats, I wouldn't do anything. Um, I would ask the patient if they had any symptoms from the vent... Uh, I wouldn't do anything with regards to their risk. I would ask the patients if they had any symptoms, I, if they were being bothered by fluttering, and if they were, then I'd give them some beta blockers. But that's largely just to control the symptoms, not because I'm worried about the risk of the patient. There is another condition called exercise-induced non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, which is, uh, I think Pam, Pam asked about this. Um, so in some people, you put them on the treadmill and then they develop non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. And because it's been brought on by exercise, it causes a great deal of anxiety in people's mind because, well, it's on exercise. That's a real worry. Actually, it's not. 3.7% of apparently healthy people, when they go on the treadmill, will have some non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. Again, the same thing applies to my mind. If I see non-sustained ventricular tachycardia on an exercise test, Firstly, I want to see, is it 3 beats? Is it 30 beats? It's a totally different ball game if it's 30 beats as opposed to 3 beats. Okay. Secondly, I would ask them about their risk factors. As I said, sudden family history of sudden death, uh, you know, congenital heart disease, blackouts, etc. I would obviously do an echo to make sure that the heart is structurally normal. And in people who have exercise-induced uh, non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, I would just want to make sure that their heart arteries are normal and that there's no narrowing, which is, uh, which is, which means that the blood isn't getting through to the heart, and that's why you're getting the non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. But once I've excluded those things, I'd be very happy to tell the patient that that exercise-induced non-sustained ventricular tachycardia is not dangerous to them, all right? Or it does not signify that their lifespan is going to be limited in any way. So I hope you found this useful. Um, I hope it alleviates some anxiety about non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. Um, I wanted to just thank you so much for all the kind words, uh, all the lovely remarks. Um, it is so, so, so empowering. It's the best thing I've ever done. So I'm really, really enjoying this. And I'll try and keep putting out some videos for you. In the meanwhile, please, please, please come and join me on my Facebook page, which is yourcardiology at gmail.com. You can email me, yourcardiology at gmail.com. I know I haven't answered, but I do intend to this weekend. And also I have a website, www.yourcardiology.co.uk. If you like these videos, please do consider sharing them. It uh, makes me feel so good when I see a bunch of subscribers joining and I see all these uh, nice messages. It's, it's the best thing ever. So thank you so much. All the best. Take care.